even within the Steven Universe fandom, people have always had a wide range of opinions about the movie. Some will tell you that it's the pinnacle of the franchise, others say that it's a disorganized mess of a story with everybody else falling somewhere in the middle. But now, over four years and a 20 episode epilogue later, I think it's a good time to look back at Steven Universe the movie and see how it holds up with the entire context of the show before and after, and that's what we're talking about today. In this video, we're going to go through Steven Universe's 82 minute feature, go through all 16 songs and the story beats in between, and discuss how the series adapted, albeit with a few narrative hiccups, to create what I still find to be an immensely enjoyable experience. Gem that loves and grows. From the very beginning, the movie really plays into the theatrical element as it starts with curtains opening to the credits as we get our first song, sung by the Three Diamonds with The Tale of Steven. And while this song does obviously add to the cinematic feel as we get some really terrific shots behind the names of the cast and crew, it also, perhaps even more directly, introduces the idea that this movie is indeed a musical. And while any Steven Universe movie would inherently have to have at least a couple songs, Songs, I really like that they decided to take the musical nature of the series, one of many fans favorite parts, and make it such a huge part of the movie. And really, there are only a few songs, such as this one, that feel like they wouldn't be a part of a regular episode of the show. Throughout the lyrics of this one, which do sacrifice a bit of the catchiness and emotional depth that many of the other songs on this soundtrack have for the sake of exposition, as as well as the storybook recap that follows, the movie does more than just give a synopsis for the series, as we get to see the titular tale of Steven from the perspective of the Diamonds, who certainly dress up the revolution during Change Your Mind, as well as simplifying some of Steven's traits. As the line about him always putting others first is portrayed as being entirely positive, something that hits a little bit differently after finishing the movie and especially future. This song about the character development of Steven obviously foreshadows a good chunk of this movie being about revisiting what that character development truly meant while also just being a really fun opener to the feature, giving us the first song with blue or white. After this song ends, we transition into a broadcast the Diamonds have set up for Steven to announce his ascension to his mother's throne to the gem world, which, after we see his new age 16 design, he instead uses to tell the world, including a pair of decrepit pink shoes at a new location, that he's going back to Earth and is no longer going to partake in gem authority shenanigans. This is not exactly what the Diamonds were expecting from Steven as they begin to plead with him to change his mind and stay with them in the palace, eventually launching into song number two. You're not her, but you While Let Us Adore You is easily the catchier of the first two songs, it's the lyrics of this one and Steven's subsequent reaction that really makes this the first very interesting moment of this movie, as the diamonds sing of wanting Steven to stick around simply because he reminds them of his mother, who is very interestingly only referred to as Pink Diamond throughout the entire film. Despite the diamonds listing all of the ways they've gotten better, no longer longer conquering or shattering, it's clear that Steven doesn't feel comfortable around them, something that never really changes throughout the rest of the franchise. Despite the fact that they are no longer actively villainous since we last saw them before the time jump, the idea that Steven ever really moves on from their horrific past just isn't the case, as he pretty clearly tries to do just the bare minimum to keep them somewhat happy and non-genocidal. 
Speaking of the time skip, that's what the next 10 or so minutes of this movie is all about, as we catch up with both the town and the inhabitants of Beach City, alongside Connie, who gets the first spotlight during this segment. In comparison to a good chunk of the cast, Connie ends up being in a pretty great spot towards the end of the original series, and thus doesn't really need that much development post Change Your Mind. But even knowing that fact doesn't help it from stinging a bit how truly little she's in this movie, as almost the entirety of her appearance outside of the scene is literally spent making fun of the fact that she has no idea what's going on. Still, seeing her and Steven in a fairly chill state as she announces her intentions to go to space camp makes for a really sweet scene between the pair, especially with Connie's last second kiss on the cheek as she bails for quite a chunk of the movie as Steven launches into the longest song on the soundtrack and easily the most foreboding. Here we are in the future and it's right. Obviously, a song five minutes into a movie about how there's no more conflict doesn't exactly fool anybody, and some of the lyrics in this one, especially Pearl's, feel a bit off for their characters, even taking into account a hefty amount of off-screen character development since Change Your Mind. But all in all, there is just simply too much to like about this song to come away from it with a negative opinion. Some of the animation while the characters sing about their past is just so beautiful, with each one having a different distinct style, with the vocals during this section being so tremendous as well. This isn't the only time in the movie to illustrate this fact, but allowing Zach Callison to sing with less of a kid voice means this movie has his best vocal performances by far in the entirety of the franchise, to the point where you have to wonder if the original show probably should have let Steven age a bit more throughout the five seasons at more of a fin speed. Anyway, besides just giving us a quick character development recap for the main cast, including a convenient another look at their original form, this song also takes the time to give us a lot of the time skip stuff that the rest of the movie is too busy to focus on, including quick looks at Little Homeworld, the off colors, and the modern day shenanigans of Bismuth, Lapis, and Peridot. Most of this stuff is left for future to fully dive into, but I feel like they balance keeping it a mystery and doing an exposition dump pretty well here. Anyway, after each gym sings about their past and how they've changed since then, hint hint, the best part of this song is clearly when they all come together to sing, as I really like them recreating the running scene from the extended intro, and even after seeing this movie a bunch of times in the last four years, I still get the exact same nostalgia rush every single time from it. Just like the opening song, this one doesn't exactly hit the catchiest of moments like some songs in this movie, including the next one, but it's still perhaps the Steven Universe the movie-est of the songs here, and just makes for a really fun sequence through and through. In case this entire song that ends with Happier Ever After Here We Are didn't tell you anything, Steven lying in the grass with his team and talking about how he wishes that everything would stay the same forever certainly does, and while this scene is perhaps a bit much in that regard, it's entirely worth it for the immensely sick scene where Garnet looks into the future and immediately panics, as we cut to see an alien pink machine drop from the sky, helmed by a manic pink gem, as she begins to use it to drill into the ground. And while yes, throughout this video I am going to talk about all the different ways that the drill as a plot device is handled so, so poorly throughout this movie, watching this gem we don't know ride in on it is such a cool moment and is a great introduction to Spinell's character. Almost as great of an introduction as the next song, and arguably the most iconic of the soundtrack. Gee, it's swell to finally meet her other friends. 
throughout this video, even if I don't mention it, whenever I talk about Spinel, you can assume two different things about her in any given scene. One, Sarah Stiles gives an unreal performance throughout this entire movie, and absolutely brings this character to life from the absolute jump. And two, every single scene with this character throughout the entire movie has some of the best animation to ever come out of Cartoon Network Studios, and both of these things are immediately introduced in her very first song. After Spinell delivers this great monologue with fantastic vocal deliveries in every sentence, she launches into her first song, Other Friends, and I have no idea where to start with this one. How about the animation, which is just casually the best that Steven Universe ever has to offer, as the rubber hose-esque cartoony nature of Spinell takes full advantage of the movie budget to just have some unfathomably good choreography at every turn of this thing. Seriously, every single one of her movements in this one just feels so fun to watch, and the way that it takes advantage of the setting is so clever that it just feels honestly unreal that somebody managed to figure it out in a way that ultimately makes it come out this smooth. Watching Spinel sprawl out across the entire screen or taunt a crystal gem in a different way is just so much fun throughout, as it really feels like this scene is a bunch of fantastic ideas that they use one after another after another in a way that just feels so special every time you watch, as the movie perfectly uses Spinel's fantastic design so stinking well. But I'll save talk about her design for a little bit later in the video. For now though, I have to talk about Sarah Stiles' vocal performance during this one, as the way that she captures Spinell's manic anger is just so, so good, as the character realizes that her worst fear has come true, as she's been completely forgotten. Every expertly written line is delivered with such conviction, as you immediately begin to sympathize with this character that's done nothing but try to kill the main cast, in what ultimately becomes one of my favorite character introductions in all of animation. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention just how ridiculously and almost unfairly catchy this whole thing is. It's a scene that begs to be rewatched, as it's almost impossible to fully appreciate the animation and writing on the first few watches, as it's so easy to be fully captured by the amount that this song absolutely slaps. Unfortunately, this song does eventually have to end, as a ridiculously well animated scene causes Spinell to slice our gem trio in half, and attempt to do the same for Steven, only for him to tank the head, giving her a taste of her own medicine as she warns about the damage she did to his gem and the damage her drill will do to the rest of him. When Steven attempts to bubble Spinel, he finds out that her warning was correct as his powers seem to be going haywire. We then get a quick cut to Steven staring at the gems on a table as Greg enters, and I just absolutely love him throughout this entire movie. Despite not having a formal arc in this one, his involvement throughout is actually pretty consistent, and the way that he freaks out in every single scene makes for a great gag. Speaking of his involvement, as Pearl reforms, we get to see exactly what Spinel's scythe did, as she is reverted to her her base form, attaching to a clueless Greg in the same way she initially attached herself to Rose, with the rest of the scene playing out in song number five. Something is clearly wrong. As I mentioned before, some songs feel natural for the series in this one, such as Other Friends, while others feel like ones that only make sense in a full musical, which very much applies to the hilariously named system slash boot dot pearl underscore final three dot info. It's not to say that this song is bad or anything, but as a song, it's definitely one of the weaker ones here, as it's definitely more of an exposition dump about their situation 
Ocean, as Pearl sings about Ruby, Sapphire, and Amethyst, as they reform to their base selves, as Steven realizes just how screwed he is. There's a bunch of really fun gags here, from Pearl thinking her new master's name is Um Greg Universe, to Ruby just freaking out the entire time, to a young copycat Amethyst creating a variety of great visual jokes, the best of which being her and Pearl looking at the camera. The best part of this one, however, by far, comes after all of the Crystal Gems reform, as a circus-esque theme suddenly weaves into the instrumental alongside a brand new Spinel, whose initial design reveals that her hair used to be hearts, her tears were once absent, and her heart-shaped gem used to be the other way around, all of which point to her having a tragic past that the movie will get to in around 33 minutes. Just as Ruby was created to guard and Pearl to serve, Spinel's reset reveals her purpose to be entertainment as she tries to get Steven to play with her, completely unaware of the chaos she caused mere moments ago. As I said before, this song is less of a song and is more of just a regular scene that Pearl happens to sing narrate over, but as a normal scene, it's a pretty darn fun introduction to the rest of the movie. Steven staring at the drill with his clueless father and five clueless gems is such a funny scene, especially with him freaking out over failing to store Spinel's weapon, and the continuously amusing lion. Eventually, the group splits up for a bit, with Steven bringing Spinel and Garnet's parts to go visit the other half of the Crystal Gems, and Greg being tasked with watching Pearl and Amethyst. And while we don't get to see this trio very often in this movie, every single time we get to see Peridot, Lapis, and Bismuth, it just works so well, and never better than in this first scene, where they all react to hearing of what we just saw unfold, interspersed with some really, really funny jokes. This myth being the one to reveal what the Rejuvenator is works really well with her blacksmith character, and it immediately launches into Steven freaking out about not being able to control his powers anymore, and even more so freaking out about the idea of having to get the diamonds involved, ultimately deciding that either they can't help or he'd rather just let the world end, as he depressingly launches into a semi reprieve of Happily Ever After. Here we are in the future, and it's wrong! In a series that has spent a good chunk of its runtime driving in the idea of the moral ambiguity of the leader of the Crystal Gems, it's no surprise the diminishing of the amount of pride that Steven and the rest of the team seem to have in that title, as the name isn't even muttered for the first 25 or so minutes of the movie. So, given the circumstances of everybody being reset to their pre-Crystal Gem self, I really like this song, Who We Are, for giving us a quick reminder that, despite some rose sketchiness, the Crystal Gems were a rebel group that fought against the most powerful entity in the universe to save the Earth. And as the last Crystal Gem from that initial group who actually remembers doing that, Bismuth being the one to sing this hype song works really well. And with the visuals and the instrumental behind it going absolutely nuts, this song certainly works, as it sets up the general structure of the rest of the movie, as they decide that they need to recreate each gem's experiences in order to bring them back starting by getting Sapphire and Ruby to once again fuse. While this song does somewhat fall into the camp of musical monologue in comparison to some of the more stereotypical songs we're about to get into, it's really fun to see Bismuth finally sing, see Peridot and Lapis shenanigans, and the camaraderie that Steven has with all three of his former foes. Coming out of the song with a great spinel gag, and our gang began their next goal, which is to cause enough danger to Sapphire that Ruby has to rush in and fuse in order to save her, which Peridot happily provides a giant pizza cutter to do so, only for Steven to obviously bail on chopping up his friend, leaving a prime opportunity for Spinel to activate the weapon and start up some shenanigans. And just as the backing crack to the scene 
foretells, hijinks do indeed ensue. And I really like the bit with Sapphire predicting each moment of chaos right before it happens. In another example of the movie using its budget to create some really fun shots. Eventually, as the reappearance of Sapphire and Ruby necessitates, we of course end up getting an adorable romantic moment between the pair. As Sapphire sees Ruby being shattered in the future, and changes her fate by doing the inverse of their initial fusing, and being the one to push Ruby out of harm's way. This whole moment is really cute and well animated, and launches us into Garnet's first song of the movie. Isn't It Love is a really fun song that feels somewhat out of place in this movie. Sure, it does somewhat fit the theme of change or whatever, but especially given Garnet's second song towards the end of this one, it doesn't really feel necessary within the scope of the film. My personal theory is that the crew wanted to do this kind of sequence and needed the movie's budget, and honestly, it might have been worth it for that alone. Seriously, the visuals during this one are a surrealist treat, and given the fact that Estelle is, well, Estelle, this one feels like a genuine pop song that still matches well with the visuals. While not one of my favorites from the movie, Isn't It Love is still quite lovely, and gets Garnet back into the film, even if she's not exactly our Garnet yet. It's a little bit hard to watch Steven somehow not get that Garnet doesn't have her memories back for quite a good amount of time, but I guess that unlike the audience, he didn't get to watch the answer and see her first design instead of just listening to it. Anyway, Garnet's story at this point is paused for a bit as we transition to the Amethyst portion of this movie, but not before the first real hint of Spinel's trauma comes into play, as when Steven tries to leave her at Little Homeworld, she suddenly freaks out, demanding that Steven can't leave her. And after a really fun scene with her and Steven riding Lion around and looking for Amethyst, they eventually find her in Vidalia's old art studio, which is a a really fun setting for the movie to revisit. Amethyst being the first character to get their character development back to normal makes sense for a variety of reasons, both logically, as she does have the shortest history of the gems, and thematically, being the closest to Steven in personality and place in the team. And of course, there was no way this movie was going to handle this development other than with a song. If you like it or not, I'm gonna be right by your side no matter what. While the idea of trying to fit the entirety of Amethyst arc into one two minute song sounds like it shouldn't work at all, I think No Matter What does a pretty terrific job, and I think a good chunk of that is entirely tied to the visuals. Sure, the call and response lyrics of this one about the camaraderie and the loyalty between the two younger parts of the Crystal Gems is really well written and catchy, but it's watching Steven take Amethyst to both really fun places as well as the home to more traumatic memories in the form of the kindergarten that truly elevate this one to being so great. With the gang going back to the train from On the Run, completing this super fun and well done sequence. Spinel during this song trying to squeeze in frame and always feeling unnatural does a perfect job in showing how she's definitely intruding somewhere that she doesn't belong, which works well with her arc later. Even if both Pearl and Garnet end up getting two songs each dedicated to them getting back to their normal selves, and Amethyst is just stuck with this one, it's still a nice ode to the character she once was, and how finding a family with the Crystal Gems allowed her to overcome the nature of her creation and become a hero. The joke of characters seeing Spinel and freaking out before realizing that she's docile is done many times throughout this movie, and yet I don't think any of them are nearly as funny as Amethyst's reaction here, as she immediately yoinks Steven out of there before manically screaming at Spinel. Eventually, the group makes it back to the drill, where we first begin to get hints about how bad it's going to become as a plot device in this movie. 
Through some scientific paradox investigation, we discover that in 41 hours, the goop from the drill will fully enter the earth and destroy all organic life. Unless you want to make a pretty weak argument about the difference between slowly feeding in the poison and what ends up happening, this statement from Peridot ends up ultimately having to be, in canon, just something that she either was completely wrong about or just made up. I get that it doesn't really matter for the overall message of the film, and is really just to set up some kind of time constraints for Steven to fix everything, but it's still not a great moment for the movie, and one I'll get more into later. Anyway, just a bit more negativity before moving on, but the explanation for why the stronger gems, or the diamonds in that matter, couldn't pick up the drill being that it might explode or something feels overly weak and convenient, and more like something hastily written to explain something in a previous episode, and not something from like 20 minutes ago. Eventually, Steven realizes that he needs Spinel back to her murdery self in order to fix anything, and the only way to learn enough about her to reset her is to reset Pearl back to normal, and thus he sets off to find her and Greg, setting up for Sadie's concert. Greg is as great during this scene as he was before, and watching him continue to freak out over every little thing is consistently really funny. Anyway, as goofy as it might sound, the idea to use a rock show to get Pearl to rebel is genuinely such a great idea, even just for the absolute banger that is the next song. In the three years in between last one out of Beach City and this movie, I became a huge Mike Kroll fan, and therefore I was really stoked when I heard he was going to be involved in this film. And I'm not sure any song without Mike Kroll's vocals could possibly sound as Mike Kroll as Disobedient, as Sadie Killer and the Suspects just absolutely knocked this one out of the park. While there are other songs in this soundtrack that I definitely appreciate more than this one on an emotional or a lyrical level, I'm not sure there are any songs I like just listening to as much as this one. The rock visuals throughout the Sadie part are great too, as the end of the world concert vibe of the entire thing is just absolutely phenomenally great. And while the quality never dips, the tone certainly changes once Amethyst grabs the mic as they decide that their next attempt to shake Pearl up is for Amethyst to do something she swore off in maximum capacity and transform into she who this movie really does not want to name. In about 10 minutes in this movie, we are going to get some of the most damning evidence against Rose's character in the entire franchise, and watching her through Amethyst coldly sing while her hair causes a shadow over her eyes makes for such a chilling moment. Especially with the way that her vocals are mixed here, which just make them sound so harsh and alien. We don't get much time to dwell on it, but watching Greg, who notably has never even slightly turned on Rose's past like everyone else, be completely unable to turn away from this mirage of her is devastating as he nearly comes to tears before managing to keep it together for his son. Just an absolutely terrific scene, and probably my favorite in this movie that doesn't heavily involve Spinel. Eventually, Steven and Amethyst come up with a new plan to unreset Pearl, which, after being cryptically hinted at, is eventually revealed in the next song. Independent together, we can fly. I desperately want to just praise Independent Together so, so much, but before getting to the million ways that this song is fantastic, let's go ahead and talk about the one pretty awkward part of it, and a debate that made the fan base of the show pretty horrible for a bit, being the nature of Steg, and how it's kinda weird for a father and son. And while the idea that fusion is an inherently romantic idea is something that's pretty clearly shown to not be accurate after about season one, most clearly in Smoky Quartz, the fact that Steven and his dad turn into a sex icon with a ripped shirt and short shorts, who does pelvic thrusts and pretty clearly arouses Pearl on stage for two minutes, is something I really, really wanted to find some way to defend, but I, I just can't. 
Still, though, if you can get past that, which I understand if you can't, this song is really, really, really good. Just the idea of it alone is fantastic, as it completely makes sense why Pearl wouldn't get her identity back just from the rebellion, as she truly only became her current self when she was forced to stop attaching herself to Rose, as the song talks about how independence doesn't mean you have to be alone. It's an extremely well sung and written song, and I really like how the visuals do a great job in showing how Pearl kept doing everything for Rose and making constant sacrifices when Rose just didn't contribute the same amount to their relationship. Which, now that I say it out loud, kind of reminds me of something else I've talked about recently, but I just can't figure out what that is. Anyway, watching everyone fly around is really sick and having Opal reappear to sing with Steg both sounds great, looks great, and fits really well thematically with the idea of staying independent while also forming relationships. This is one that is really catchy too, ultimately becoming one of only a few songs in this movie to be a really great listen, a really fun watch, and a really well written song into the movie. All of which help overcome the initial awkwardness of it. All throughout this song, it will occasionally cut to Spinell feeling completely torn up about what she's seeing unfold, and once Steven unfuses, absolutely physically wrecked by the stress that it puts on his gem, Pearl explains what she knows about Spinell, being that she was Pink Diamond's playmate in her garden that Pearl hasn't seen in thousands of years. Steven sends Lion off to find Connie while he investigates where Spinell has gone, and it's here where we get the best example of how absolutely exhausted Steven is throughout this entire film, and how he hides that from everybody while he tries to fix everything. And the way that this plays out in this movie without any real downsides was probably its biggest legitimate non-drill criticism when it first released. But now, four years and a Steven Universe future later, it just feels more foreboding than anything, as the audience knows how well the strategy works for Steven moving forward. Anyway, more on that when I make my full video on future, which will somehow be even longer than this one, but for now, Steven finds Spinell sobbing on the warp, and easily switches from exhaustion back into fixer mode. As Steven tries to get memories to keep flooding back to her, he eventually mentions the garden that Pearl talked about, which causes her to take Steven there, where the beautiful sounding garden is revealed to be abandoned in the modern day. Spinell begins to explain her relationship with Pink, as we see her and her diamond playing in the garden happily goofing off together until Pink gets news from Blue and Yellow Diamond that she's finally getting a colony, something that overjoys Pink, except when Spinell seems to think that means that she's going too. The rest of the story plays out in song form, where the movie perhaps hits its emotional high. Stand very still, this'll be so much fun. If you haven't seen this movie in a couple of years, I promise you that Drift Away is just as fantastically devastating as you remember it being. The story of Pink Diamond leaving Spinell in the garden to wait for thousands of years is more than rough, and since we get this entirely from Spinell's perspective, as she obeys her diamond's last command to stand still while being forced to stare at what seems to be Earth in the distance, the hints earlier in the movie about Spinell's tragic past quickly become overbearing in how immediately and immensely this song makes you feel for her. And and while I do think I'm a little bit less fond of this song from a sound perspective than most others, as I think parts of it are a bit over the top for how depressing it's supposed to be, there's no denying that this is simply one of the best written songs in the franchise. Every line just wrecks the audience one after another, as we see Spinell begin to deteriorate, as the garden, Spinell's special world as indicated by the soundtrack, falls apart around her, before she finally receives the news that Pink isn't coming back. 
Spinel sings of the feeling of waiting for Pink, only to learn that Pink Diamond never intended to come back. She spent all of this time devoting herself to one person who didn't even have the decency to tell them that she wasn't coming back. This is where Spinel's anger that we saw at the beginning of the movie begins to make sense. Unlike the fact that she got two of the most powerful weapons of the show in the span of Steven singing happily ever after, but whatever. As Spinel ultimately knows that she can't take her wrath out on Pink Diamond because there is no Pink Diamond. Drift Away is just a spectacularly well-written moment of the show that dazzles with so many fantastic shots, ultimately becoming the emotional centerpiece in the movie quite easily, and likely the part of the film that somebody is first to bring up in discussion for good reason. As Spinell joins the ranks of the fantastic tragic characters of Steven Universe, and just like the rest of them, Steven takes up the challenge of trying to fix her. When Spinell gets back to her normal-ish self, complete with a flipped heart and tears etched into her design, she begins to lash out at Steven before eventually destroying the projector, realizing that what she truly hates was the news received and not the kid who delivered it. Eventually, Steven's plea for Spinell to start over back on Earth turns into our next and my pick for this movie's most underrated song. Song. You just need to find someone. While Found certainly isn't the catchiest or the most theatrical song from the soundtrack, that doesn't stop it from still being one of my favorites from it. While the visuals during this one are fairly simplistic, and the duet style of Spinell and Steven pretty standard, it's the writing of this one that just genuinely blows me away. As the movie has Steven seemingly solve Spinell's issues, only for them to obviously blow up again in about five minutes, something that could reek of being a classic Act 3 misunderstanding, only if this song didn't do such a fantastic job in subtly indicating that Spinell is not really really fixed after this song, even if she does calm down. Despite the fact that the pair are singing the same words, Steven and Spinell are not singing about the same thing here. As Steven sings of finding love within yourself and creating new relationships on equal footing, while Spinell sings of replacing the relationship she had with Pink with a relationship with her son. Steven notes that Spinell will quote, somehow love again. But what she was missing was not this neat little duet, but something much grander that this movie is going to dive into deeper in about 10 minutes. Spinell needed change, and all Steven has led her to do is reform the exact same relationship she had with Pink. After another scene where everyone freaks out about Spinell as if she isn't clearly being escorted by Steven, this one featuring the return of Connie and one of Greg's best gags in the movie, Spinell happily removes the drill from Earth to the relief of the gems, and Steven immediately turns his attention to fixing Garnet and his gem so that he can go back to having no problems, something that immediately irks Spinell. Steven is so focused on on getting back to his beloved happily ever after and fixing every little thing that once Spinell is no longer threatening to actively end the world, he moves his attention to the next thing. As she gets angrier and angrier, all it takes is for Spinell to discover that Steven was holding on to the rejuvenator to come to the conclusion that Steven was just going to reset all of her trauma away again. And since none of the gems seem to have the reaction speed necessary to stop it, especially Lapis, who has done much more impressive things with water than stop a drill from going into the earth, Spinell decides that if Steven can't pay attention to her, then he shouldn't pay attention to anything else either. 
She's once again devoted her entire life to a relationship with one person, and as soon as that dedication is demonstrated to not be equal, she once again snaps. As she continues to taunt Steven, she eventually brings the still oblivious Garnet into the fray, still mockingly begging Steven to use the rejuvenator on her, almost as if she actually wants to go back to who she once was. Eventually, Steven loses his patience, screaming that her belief that he was going to reset her isn't quote true, with that final word being what launches Garnet back to her normal self and into her second song. It's the true kind of love. True Kind of Love is definitely my favorite of Estelle's pair of songs in this one, as she sings about the importance of the true kind of love in Weathering Life, something that rings true both for Garnet as a fusion, and for Spinel, who is currently on a murderous rampage because her one loved one betrayed her trust. The fight that goes on during this one isn't the most visually impressive of the episode, but it's still really fun and well choreographed, and clearly demonstrates that, without the rejuvenator and without the element of surprise, Pink's little playmate stands no chance against the crystal gems. As Spinel, after being forced to see who she truly has become in Garnet's visor, has to flee the fight, and sends the rest of the poison directly into the earth, ending the world just as Peridot declared. Except that, obviously, the world doesn't actually end, and is just pretty fractured. As with 16 minutes left to go, Spinel has gotten rid of the biggest threat of the episode. Right after Steven himself destroyed the Rejuvenator, the second biggest threat of the episode, as Spinel is seemingly out of tricks. And while this does seem like it should kill the tension, especially as Steven sends everyone out to rescue the town, the reason that it still works pretty well, besides just the fact that the group groovy instrumental of True Kind of Love is still banging in the background is because the movie was never about the poorly implemented drill. It was always about Spinel overcoming what happened to her, and that's still yet to come. And after the instrumental, we actually get a Steven verse before the end of the song that ultimately becomes my favorite part of it. As while he climbs the glass tube, somehow without most of his powers, and what is objectively a beautiful shot anyway, Zach Callison delivers some of this movie's most heavenly vocals, begging Spinell to let him help her move on. When Steven makes it to the top of the tower, he finds a still Spinell, who tells Steven that she doesn't want to play anymore, and when Stephen loses his patience and snaps again, she delivers two of the least cartoony punches in the entirety of the franchise, as her rubber hose animation has faded to simple violence causing Steven's nose to begin to bleed. Spinel then dangles Steven over the ledge and begins to slowly loosen her grip, which causes him to have the breakdown he's been fighting for over an hour as he realizes that he's falling into the same situation that he's always finding himself in. As he's dealing with conflict caused by his mother, and yet he still hasn't reverted to his powerful self from the beginning of the movie. Spinell continues to mock Steven as she has, eventually asking how he ever saved the universe if he started so weak, which causes him to find his final peace. Just as this entire movie has been leading up to, Steven finds the only thing stopping him from becoming who he wanted to be, as he realizes his power to change and finally gets his transformation scene, showing off his powers as he goes into the final full song of the movie, named after what he was missing the entire time. We don't have to fight. 
change is the action climax of this movie that's been pretty void of action since its villain was in baby mode for quite some time. And if you somehow forgot how talented at fight choreography the Steven Universe crew is since other friends, change does not waste any time before reminding you. As we get some ridiculously fun shots here, as Steven sings of his ability to do anything by changing who he is. Anything but change Spinel, which ultimately only she has the power to do. She's too busy thrashing Steven to pay attention to this though, as he continues to promise Spinel isn't too far gone and can still fix this, a promise she ignores as she delivers the biggest hit of the movie, slamming Steven into the top of the drill, which is revealed to be a hardened metal heart. After Steven tanks this hit, Spinel finally hits her breaking point, as we learn why Steven's message of the possibility of change didn't exactly immediately work for her. She's spent thousands of years sitting in the garden waiting for something to happen, waiting for something to change, only for that something to be her learning the truth, which led her to a spiral of rage resulting in her almost undoing the work of the one she once cared most about. Spinel never really wanted change, she just wanted things to stay the same and for her and Pink Diamond to keep playing in the garden. As she sobs to Steven about how she's let down her one job, which was to be a friend to others, the drill beneath them breaks down at the same time as the walls around her heart, exploding as we get the Steven Universe staple of him coming out of chaos in a smooth bubble. Before getting to the end of Spinel's story, we get a quick stoic moment of Steven accepting that there is no happily ever after, and that there's always more work to do. And while he seems like he takes it somewhat well here, the entirety of future ultimately ends up revolving around Steven trying to figure out what that reality means for him. As Steven begins to fix any consequences caused by Spinel's chaos, we get to one of the issues I have with this movie right at the very end, which is where Spinel ends up at the end of this thing. As she walks away from Steven, she talks about needing to work on herself and through her own problems before she can dive right back into a friendship which is honestly where I think they should have taken her character, but alas, the show instead sends the diamonds in from above. And after Steven declines their offer to live on Earth with him, they spot a different little pink creature who just lost her diamond, and begin to serenade her with the next song on the soundtrack. Come on, just let us adore you. I hate to be a bit of a downer right at the end of this movie, but as much as I do love them bringing back Let Us Adore You, and I actually don't even mind Spinel ending up living with the diamonds by the end of Future, and I especially love how that affects Steven, as I talked about in my video about Homeworld Bound, I just think it's a little bit quick and easy for both Spinel and Steven that everything ends up working out like this, and that the movie ends with the grieving Spinel finding the grieving diamonds, as they both replace what Pink Diamond meant in their life. Still, I understand that for the movie to stand alone and not rely on future, that Spinel may have needed more solid ending than just going out into space to work on herself. But I think that a time skip where she lived on Earth and Little Homeworld for a while before the diamonds came and got her would have worked pretty well too. Anyway, I do really like Spinel's final few shenanigans for the movie, the way they work found into the reprieve works really well, and getting Spinel out of the way does help the final song of the movie, as Steven once again sings about happily ever after, but from a different lens. Happily ever after, there we were, and here we are. Finale is a great final song at doing everything it sets out to do, as it truly feels like the cinematic happy ending this film needed, without betraying the idea that happily ever after isn't a real thing. 
The final few scenes of this movie are dedicated to showing the town recovering from what Spinell did, while still having some pretty clear scars as nobody will ever truly forget what happened. The final shot of the movie is purely meant to fully complete the musical motifs set up by the first scene, as after walking down the stage with his family, Steven receives his flowers as the credits roll. While Steven Universe, the movie, is not a perfect film, as the drill as a plot device is horribly managed, characters like Lapis and Connie are shoved away, and the ending somehow feels rushed, in an otherwise really well-paced movie, it's possibly the perfect Steven Universe experience. Everything you could possibly love about the show, from the beautiful backgrounds, to the gut-wrenching dialogue, to the show-stopping songs, to the well-designed characters, with devastating backstories, to the feel-good moments that elevate everything else, all of those things are in this movie, and to a quality that matches almost anything else in the show. It's a film that feels so Steven Universe, while also taking advantage of the movie format and budget, delivering a truly feature-length film with some of the best animation to ever come out of Cartoon Network Studios. And while so many things come together to create this unforgettable experience, the majority of the most impactful come from one source, or one character, in the form of Spinel. After the absolutely chaotic introduction of Other Friends, which is genuinely one of the most fun sequences I've ever seen animated, from the moment that Spinell resets to a completely innocent and fun-loving gem dedicated to friendship, it's clear that, in a show that doesn't kill villains, that Spinell was going to get a happy ending. And yet, despite it being clear where she was going to end up, the movie still morphs her through her fantastic voice from Sarah Stiles, her fantastic rubber hose-esque animation, and moments such as Drift Away into a character that immediately became as beloved as much of the other cast, as her struggles and pain is portrayed in a way that's impossible to not sympathize with. A common criticism of this movie is that it plays it too safe and retreads over much of the series in order to do so, as besides just having retellings of On the Run or the answer, Spinell's story is also a combination of a bunch of other gems who retaliate because of something Rose did. But I really don't think I mind it, as what should a Steel Universe movie be but a celebration of everything the show stood for, and there was no better way to do that than through Spinell. I think this criticism specifically has been somewhat addressed by Future as well, which in general, that season just makes this movie significantly better, as it addresses some of the larger problems, such as the lack of Steven facing longer-term mental strife for everything that happens to him in this film. Before ending this video, which I'm sure is under 30 minutes just like I planned, I think I would be remiss if I didn't spend some time talking about the theme of this movie, and consequently, its treatment of Rose. As the universe often is, the movie is not not subtle with its theme, as it's a celebration of the ability to change and how important it is to become a good person. We see Amethyst, Garnet, and Pearl go through accelerated versions of this, as they each react to the often negative circumstances around them to become better people, and it's what Spinell is attempting to do at the end of the movie with her newfound relationship with the Diamonds. A common refrain that I've heard Heard about this movie is that it makes Pink Diamond or Rose Quartz into its true villain, as without her being around anymore, the movie doesn't have to redeem her. While there is some truth to how the show's message of everybody being able to become a better person does sometimes run a bit thin, I think seeing Pink as this completely irredeemable creature after this movie is not the conclusion they want you to come to. As I mentioned earlier in 
this video, the phrase rose quartz is not in this movie, and I think there are two ways you could interpret this fairly clearly intentional choice. Either it's meant to showcase her as the most morally gray the franchise ever has, as I implied before, or it's to draw a line between the person Pink Diamond was and the gem that Rose Quartz became. While seeing Rose and Spinel's relationship from Spinel's perspective in Drift Away is devastating, and an exasperated Steven agrees with his mother's cruelty, it's easy to not think about why Rose did what she did. She left Spinel behind because she finally got her own colony, and knew that Spinel would never leave her alone long enough to run it. Did she handle it perfectly? Of course not, as just like Bismuth, she had thousands of years to try and fix her mistake, and never had the courage to go back and do so. But at the same time, Pink Diamond does change, almost more than anybody in the show, from the whiny brat of Jungle Moon to the literal savior of humanity. One of the first things we ever learn about Rose Quartz is that she is the only reason that humans are still on Earth. And after Afterwards, we learn about the awful things that she did to a few different gems. If the order of these revelations were reversed, so would her overall legacy. But ultimately, this movie isn't about changing the past. Rose can't become a better person anymore because Rose doesn't exist anymore, but Steven can still help Spinel. Steven Universe was always a show about being better and helping others be better too, and the movie takes that, just like everything else in the series, and truly turns it into a spectacle that I still remember watching for the first time four years ago, and will always hold close to my heart, as despite its flaws, it's still one of the most heartfelt and emotionally charged films I've ever had the honor of watching, and I hope that I've done it justice in this video, which has now gone on for way longer than I ever wanted it to. Anyway, somehow that's about it for me. Thank you so 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 much to anybody who made it all the way through this video. As I know, when I promised I would do it back in August, I definitely meant to have it done sooner, but I hope it wasn't too bad of a wait. As for what's next in my journey through post Change Your Mind Steven Universe, as I promised before, I am going to make a video about the entirety of Steven Universe's future, as I defend its place in the franchise. But since it's probably going to take quite a while to make, as it's probably going to be even longer than this video, it's definitely not coming this year. In between though, I am going to do some smaller videos about some Steven Universe episodes I really love, so if you want to be a part of choosing which ones I talk about, you can look at my community tab where I often post polls about that kind of stuff. If you want to tell me about all the ways I'm wrong about this movie, you can either comment below or find me and all my other horrible opinions on Twitter. But either way, this has been April Samuel, and I'll see you in a week with a video that will hopefully be shorter. Thanks for watching.